It's the early 2000s, and you and your younger sister have one obsession. Barbie. Wow. Despite my mom's best intentions to buy us all gender-neutral toys, my sister and I ended up really going hardcore for Barbie. And so pretty soon, that was every holiday, every birthday, and we got all of the movies, and we had quite a few of the dolls, shiny, sparkly, iridescent, uncontrollably pink dolls. And it was a magical time. My sister and I went through all of the girl franchises. We had Barbies and Polly Pockets and My Little Ponies. And looking back on those, cupcakes featured really heavily in almost all of them. There is this trope. I feel like nobody is talking about it. Sugar represented as a good in children's media. I can think of a few examples from my childhood. We have Candyland, obviously. We have My Little Pony, for which cupcakes are basically a staple of the series. We have Strawberry Shortcake, and we have, of course, the aforementioned Barbie. All four of those are very sugar-centric series. It happens in Mario. Mario Kart and Mario Party are some clear offenders. Some media that isn't necessarily directed towards kids, but kids still could be considered a major audience of, is cooking shows. I did a quick Google search for cooking shows with kids and clicked on the first result I saw because that's what a mother would likely do. And most of the results listed on the website were dessert-focused shows. Great British Bake Off, Zumbo's Just Desserts, nailed it. Sweets-centric shows are often associated with child-friendly shows. You also have YouTube Kids, which, now from experience I can say, is as terrifying as you think it is. On YouTube Kids, you can create three different types of profiles. For each of these age ranges, the algorithm supposedly will recommend different kinds of content that would be appropriate for that age range. So for each of those profiles, I did a really, really simple search. I searched cooking, food, and baking. And for each of the profiles, the results were kind of the same. For the preschool age range, cooking had way more sweets in it than in the 8 to 12 range. Food was the most innocuous. Often you would have healthy eating or not being picky or something about the food pyramid, which is the government's second favorite conspiracy triangle. Though across the board, if you look at baking, baking is gonna be whack. Baking is very, very sugar focused, which I guess goes with the territory. And since it is Christmas, I wanna bring up that Christmas properties are also a really big factor in this. Sugar and Christmas have gone together for a super long time. Just like how any holiday is going to involve food that is more decadent than what people normally enjoy. So the Christmas part is to be expected, but I still maintain there's something kind of weird going on. Why is so much children's media sugar-centric when healthy eating is kind of an unequivocal good? I wondered though, is sugar in children's media more of a marketing ploy of the past? I checked in with some of our favorite sugar-centric franchises, and I guess, spoiler alert, no, it's all basically completely the same. Let's just go down the list of the franchises I had the most connection to as a kid. For My Little Pony, cupcakes are basically a staple of the series. There is a character who lives in a bakery and makes cupcakes for her living, and almost every single event, not even just celebration, but event, requires its own special kind of cupcake or cake or pie. Cupcakes are a very consistent feature throughout the whole length of My Little Pony. And have I watched all of it? No, but did I watch most of it? There is no hiding the sugar-centric storytelling in Strawberry Shortcake. Whoa, that is hard to say. There isn't. She's a baker that came from a small town to now the big city, which is called the Big Apple, and I know that's the obvious joke, but it's still pretty cute. Again, we have a character who is a baker who makes her living creating baked goods, and baked goods are just kind of all over the place, everywhere, all the time, 100 per, ten, per pent up the pint. Candyland can't avoid the candy because it's in its name, but, oh, <laughs> Big burp for how big of a point this is. But would you believe me if I told you that Candyland is getting even more candy-centric? I found this article where this lady is comparing one of the original Candyland boards to a more modern Candyland board. Not only do the character models get thinner 
as you move into the more modern boards, you also have more candy on the board. The original Candyland, it didn't just have candy, it also had a nut farm and Plumpy, who lived underneath the plum tree. These are both things that are probably going to be used for candy, but it isn't candy per se, whereas now those have completely moved away. Now you just have candy and chocolate and who knows what all over the board, but the characters have gotten thinner. And then finally, my beloved Barbie, somewhat transferred out of this sugar girly stage. It still is present. I know this isn't the most recent iteration of Barbie, but Life in the Dream House is definitely a cupcake-centric show. There's a lot of Barbie stuff on YouTube now, and when I've gone and looked at the Barbies that are in the store, there aren't, like, fairies for candy. There aren't fairies for anything. Where's the cool princesses? Those were my favorite ones! Maybe they got a cease and desist from Disney. Maybe Disney has, like, copyrighted the idea of princesses now. You better look out for like any of your non-Disney princesses. Oh, what even are the non-Disney princesses? Princess Zelda? Oh no, Nintendo, no! So Barbie seems to be transitioning away from it, but it's definitely a part of the media franchise as a whole, and a lot of that media is still the thing that kids are gonna find when they search it up on Netflix. So arguing whether or not it's not part of the branding anymore is a little bit moot. So Barbie gets a, meh. It's like half of a cupcake. Which half? Just the bottom half, there's no frosting. For every Candyland, there are dozens of other board games that aren't candy focused. And for every Strawberry Shortcake, there are hundreds of other poorly animated shows for your kid to pilfer through. There are thousands of children's media IPs What's the big deal if a few of them are focused on sweets? Part of the deal is, it's the big ones. Barbie, My Little Pony, Strawberry Shortcake, these are all household names. Why is it all the most popular shows? Sugar really seems to be selling in children's media. Sugar seems to be selling in adults media too. Great British Bake Off is a phenomenon. There are millions of social media accounts devoted to sweets and Pinterest is basically built off of the back of the sugar cane. And I think that's the problem. Sugar is normalized. Sugar is bad, and we all know that, so I'm not going to belabor you with all of the stats, but it's bad. It's more addictive than cocaine bad. It's 75% of Americans eat too much sugar bad. It's one in five children experiencing childhood obesity bad. It's a crisis. And in a crisis, you need to look at all of the different factors and see what's affecting it and do your best to be productive against whatever the crisis is doing. And yeah, we should look at food and we should look at advertisement, but that's not all of the problem. If we are developing nostalgic feelings for a piece of cake because we slapped a cute character onto it, I think that's kind of a problem. And here's something I'm gonna harp on probably until the day I die. Children's media is lucrative. Nobody is going to rewatch things or want to buy merchandise nearly as much as children. And once you get a child hooked into whatever sort of system or storytelling or characters you have, then they are going to carry that nostalgia into adulthood. And then they will want to buy their kids the same toys that they had and the cycle will repeat. If anybody is going to be held to the highest standards in media, it needs to be those creating children's media because they kind of have the most to gain and the least to lose. But I do think it's the responsibility of children's media makers to, I don't know, base their show on something that isn't going to poison their viewer base. This is no new phenomenon by any means, but it is a new problem. Sweets have been used as the basis for fantasies and children's stories basically as long as either of those have existed. But what drives me crazy about this is no one seems to be talking about it. Why can't I find a TV Tropes article about this? The trope has existed a long time, but it has changed. The Nutcracker is a great example of a child- Did someone just like fall down the stairs? That is so scary. I should probably go check. A classic example is the Nutcracker. It hits all the beats. It's a Christmas story, it's a fairy story, it's marketed towards girls. People are going to go to the ballet because they want to see some kind of spectacle. And the idea of living in a world full of sweets is a pretty big spectacle. This used to be a big draw to the sugar fairyland setting. A world full of sugar didn't just mean a world full of something that tasted good, it also means a world full of opulence, because sugar and other things to make confections 
were much more expensive in the past than they are today. It used to be something that was much more rare and more of a treat, simply by the fact that it was a lot harder to get to. Also, they didn't have all these wacky, crazy chemicals in their food that we have today. If you go back a hundred years, the idea of living in a world full of sweets means you're living in a world full of fairies and magic and riches and wonder. Let's go back to 300 years, to the story of Hansel and Gretel. Hansel and Gretel come across the gingerbread house in the woods, and they meet the old woman who feeds them all of these wonderful sweets that she's created to fatten them up to eat them. When Hansel and Gretel realize what the old woman is doing, they push her into her own oven to destroy her, and then they flee from the house. In some versions of the story, Hansel and Gretel break a vase and inside find treasure and escape with the treasure from the house. In this story, the sweet house is not somewhere to be lived. Notice, Hansel and Gretel destroyed the witch. They could have moved in, like, who's gonna come and try to claim her place as an inheritance? I, I don't know, is the bank gonna come and take it, have an estate sale, line all the little gumdrops up in a row and charge, like, 50 cents for each of them? I think you can interpret this story two different ways. In one way, the candy house is destroyed with the witch. She is destroyed in her oven, the oven destroys her, and the fire that's created from that likely burnt down the gingerbread house. The tempting sugar house is destroyed along with the temptress and her device by which to make the tempting articles. Another interpretation is you're supposed to flee from something that is too wondrous. Maybe the house is still there. Maybe people happen upon it and they live in it or maybe it just started to decay over time. But either way, Hansel and Gretel knew better than to live in that place. A candy house isn't somewhere sustainable. You can't live in a house made of candy. So what is Pinkie Pie doing? Our stories have completely forgotten about this moral. A gingerbread house in its original story is a symbol of something not being quite what it seems. The old stories are trying to warn us against a place that's like that. But now, we sell playsets to little girls of the same house that children were warned against 300 years ago. Let's go to a little bit more recent story, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So Charlie and the other children are chosen as potential heirs for the chocolate factory and one by one, each of the children eat the candy in the factory and it becomes their downfall. Charlie also fails. He eats of the forbidden fruit, but he also gives it back. Charlie isn't saved by eating candy, he's saved by resisting it by resisting taking it, by resisting partaking in it. And his reward in the film, it's the chocolate factory, but they don't go to another sweet-filled layer. They don't start eating as much chocolate as they can. Instead, they get in a magical elevator and fly away. He's free. Like Hansel and Gretel, he has left the candy house. When I was in about third grade, I wanted an easy bake oven. I schemed which one of my parents would be the more likely to get it for me, and I determined that my father was the weaker of the two. And so when we next went to Alco, which is just a smaller, more depressed Walmart, I went and picked an easy bake oven off the shelf, and I brought it trembling up to my father and asked, may I have this? And to my surprise, he said yes. So I took it home, and I was really excited, and I took out all the little packages, and I really quickly started to feel defeated. The baking was really subpar. It was just mixing powders with water and then I put it in the little thing and I put it in the oven and it took a super long time. And then when it came out, it wasn't even cooked all the way through and it didn't taste very good. Looking back on that memory, I can't decide what I wanted. Did I want to bake or did I want sugar? The oven is sold as an introduction to baking, but I knew how to bake at home. What I didn't have at home very often were sweets. Because at home we really didn't get sugar very often at all. I used the oven once and then never again. And I thank whichever of my parents finally just brought it to a thrift store and removed my shame from me. Looking back on that memory, I don't think I wanted to bake. I think I just wanted the sugar. From what we're streaming to what our Pinterest feed is filled with, we kind of start to build up an expectation of what food should be. We are surrounded by the most beautiful, most delicious looking foods constantly. And then of course we're disappointed when we look in the fridge and all that's in there is a wilted bag of spinach and some apple cider vinegar. The internet is so sugar focused that it's a meme whether or not something is a cake. And usually the answer is it is a cake. We are in a sugary digital paradise that we just 
can't handle and we need to wake up. Sugar-centric stories for kids are disgusting. It's elevating something that is not good for them and they should not be consuming on a regular basis to the status of these characters are eating it every day and they're living in it and they're swimming in it and their clothes are made out of it. And they present it as if it's normal and sell backpacks with it. It's like if we showed shows about how awesome and cool drug, I don't know, I guess we do that too. Or al we do it with alcohol as well. What is it with us representing these substances on TV as if they're totally normal to just have all the time. It's not, and we're not seeing the ramifications for it. And okay, sure, maybe an adult is able to tell the difference between the two, but a kid? What good argument can you have for cupcakes being a mainstay feature of your children's programming? That kids like it? Just because they like it doesn't mean it's good for them. What good argument can you make for setting your children's story in a world made of a substance more addictive than cocaine? We already have kids addicted to TV and video games. Do we really need to get them addicted to sugar as well? We have to assess messages that we take for granted. Cupcakes equal good is not a good message. If we eat with our eyes, what are we serving up on our screens? What are we feeding our kids? Maybe you're not going to be suckered ha, into it. <coughs> Big sugar is coming for me. They're putting stuff in the vents and just spreading it all the way through so that I'll be coughing and can't finish the video. But we won't let big sugar stop us. What do we do? I actually think that being grossed out is a really good first step because you'll start to notice this stuff. If you are in the position where you can choose stories for children, consider not telling them the stories or picking up the books that are super sugar focused. Tell kids stories about animals or history or mythology. <laughs> You don't need to tell them stories about sugar. We have an amazing capacity to choose. We get to choose so much about our food and our content and our lifestyles. And with that opportunity also comes a responsibility to choose well. If we're lucky, we'll get three meals in a day and we can only consume so many stories in 24 hours. But between those two choices, you can really make or break a life. Okay, so here's my pitch. It's Pixie Hollow meets Strawberry Shortcake, but with a very PBS edutainment spin. So you have these fairies, and they live in this like magical garden or something, and each of them, they, you know, maybe there is like a strawberry fairy or a basil fairy or whatever, but it's all for plants. And they teach kids how to cook with the plants. And the recipes are super simple. You know, it doesn't require the like, heat, or maybe it doesn't require a knife, lots of like tearing of lettuce. And maybe there's one episode where they find this huge sugar cube and they just don't know what to do with it. And the moral of the story is they give everybody in the garden just like a little tiny piece. So not only is it teaching kids the virtue of sharing, but it's also teaching the virtue of portion control. When you buy the dolls, you get a little packet of seeds. And so then you can like grow the seeds and like a certain time of day, she'll remind you to go check on the seeds and then you can grow the seeds together. So, PBS, hit me up.